very much. Uh, this is the last session of the of the seminar of this year. It's actually, uh, incidentally, the last session of my organizing this seminar, which comes to an end after three wonderful years. Even though half of that has been spent watching talk from our from our couch, uh, but uh, it's it's been fun anyways. So I think it, uh, it's a very proper conclusion of the of the series uh, to have Dan here. I mean, we most of us <coughs> know Dan, so it doesn't need a lot of presentation, but my personal experience, I came to know Dan's work in 2013, when he was giving a very brilliant talk at the ISH conference in Montpellier in 2013. I think that talk, many years later, became your uh, ESL, the Salary a Machine paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, uh, so Dan has been working on many, many different topics in philosophy of biology. The, I think the, the, the paper that needs to be mentioned the most is the concept of mechanism in, in, in biology, which is, uh, for a philosophy paper, has a ridiculous amount of citations. Um, and uh, his work, almost more historically oriented work on the uh, organicist tradition in England before, before the establishment of the modern synthesis. This is an, uh, more recent project. Is there a paper ready, or is the paper forthcoming? For this? Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through. There's yeah. a book coming. There's a book coming yeah, on this. Yes. Why? Fantastic. So, without further ado, you have the floor. All right. Well, thank you, Andrea, uh, for this kind introduction and also for kindly inviting me to uh, to speak to you today. I'm very excited, and I'm hoping we'll have a very stimulating uh, two hours. Uh, so, as Andrea has mentioned, I'm a historian and philosopher of biology. What I'm going to be presenting you, to you today is an exercise in integrated HPS, like everything I do. It's an attempt to bring together philosophical examinations and analyses with some historical work, including some archival research that I've done on this topic. And my focus, as you can show you probably guess by now, is this book, What is Life, which um, is really, I think, undeniably one of the most well-known, most famous books science books of the 20th century. In fact, I would excuse you if you thought that, um, or you suspected that, I mean, surely there can't be anything new to say about such a famous book. Um, and I'm hoping that if nothing else, my talk will convince you that there's still plenty uh, to, uh, to learn about, and uh, not just about the historical details that led to the production of these, uh, of the biological lectures that they <coughs> converted into the book that everyone knows, but also about the relevance of these ideas for contemporary biological theory. So I'm hoping that you will you'll get a, a sense of why, even if you're not interested in history, we should be interested in revisiting uh, what is life. Okay? Now, this project actually began uh, as basically a commentary, <laughs> a short report that I was asked to write uh, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the publication of this book. The book was published in 1944, so in 2018-2019, um, it occurred to me um, it would be nice to basically write on, on, on this book, but uh, as I learned more about the book's origins and its impact, I realized there was scope there for a nice juicy paper. I tend to write very juicy long papers. And then as I got more into it, I realized that there were, even a paper would not be enough to do this, uh, the research that I did for this justice. So um, I'm actually now under contract to produce a little element in the Philosophy of Biology series uh, that Grant Trump's in my <coughs> for CUP. Um, I was surprised to find when I Googled that the Google Books already has a book, <laughs> even though it doesn't exist yet. Um, it's expected in August 2023. So uh, think of today as a little taste of what is to come next year. Hopefully, what I say to you today will sufficiently animate you to convince you to read uh, the book when it's published in a year, a year from now. As it's, you know, these, these are very short books. I think uh, Charles has a very nice, uh, recently published, uh, also these are normally about 30,000 30, words. They're short books. But even though it's a short book that I'm preparing, uh, I will not be able to present everything uh, today. Um, I will be indicating uh, when I'm moving on to the next topic. So if you're interested, uh, just uh, remember, and in the Q&A, you can ask me about the things that I missed. I'm not trying to do justice to everything I want to say about this book, okay? So without further ado, let me then just begin with the story. And of course, the story has to begin with the lectures. I, I'm, afraid, I'm sorry if you can't see uh, the writing here. This is the original poster that was uh, printed uh, Dublin, uh, in, in Dublin, where, 
uh, shortly than it was in 1943, uh, London Institute for Advanced Studies, only the second one uh, in the world that was modeled after the one in Princeton, which uh, Einstein was, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Ireland, set this one up specifically for Schrodinger. And as part of, uh, of his responsibilities as the director of, uh, of the School of Theoretical Physics, there were two schools incidentally, the other one was Celtic Studies, even today, that's the way that the institute is, is, is divided up and done that it today. As part of his responsibilities, he was supposed to, he was asked to give uh, annually a series of public lectures. Okay, so in 1943, he decided to uh, basically choose this topic, what is life here? You probably can't read that. It says the physical aspect of the living cell. That's the subtitle of his lectures that were delivered, as you can see here, uh, in uh, August uh, 3rd, 12th, and 18th, 19th. Right in the middle of the Second World War. There were a hit, it was a sensation. It was reported in the Irish Times. Politicians came, the people from the you know from the literary circles came. It was in fact so successful, so popular that he was asked to deliver the lectures a second time. So these were on a Friday and then on a Monday also because there were so many people interested. Uh, showing his wife talks in correspondence to Max Born about how it was a bit like an opera premiere. There were like Everyone came with their newspapers early on to <coughs> wait for the big, uh, great Schrodinger to appear uh, and, and, and present on this uh, wonderful, of course, fundamental, you know, wonderful question of what is life. Um, and um, <coughs> Schrodinger, from the very beginning, uh, intended to publish uh, these lectures, and so he did. Um, there's a very really interesting story about the publication of the book. Initially, there was an Irish publisher um, that was committed to printing the book, um, but then showing at the last minute uh, added an epilogue to the book on indeterminism and free will. This hadn't been part of the lectures. And the Irish publisher, big Catholic um, uh, publisher at the time, refused to basically accept the book because um, you know, there were some sort of uh, you know, appeals to Vedanta philosophy and so on. And so he uh, eventually got the book published in Cambridge University Press in December 1944. Here is the book, and here, I guess, I don't know if you can see, but it says, so the physicist approach to the subject, this was the subtitle that was eventually used, um, and then it says also with an epilogue on determinism of free will. Now, this is a very, very short book. It's about 90 pages long. It's a small book. There's a copy of it there. You can read it in an afternoon. One of the uh, famous reviews of this book, I think it's at the back of that version, says you read it in an afternoon, but it will change. It will take you a lifetime to forget it. It's like it will change your life uh, once you read it. Um, and it really was a sensation. Uh, it, it was very quickly translated into half a dozen languages. It went through uh, several editions, the first already in 1946. Um, and just looking online, I was able to find uh, all these different versions of the book in different languages. So it's become a really sort of a cornerstone, really, of, of 20th century popular science. Everyone has heard of it. Now, what's interesting is that well, one, of this, one of the motivations that I've had in, in developing this project is, is that I guess Darwin's Origin is another example, or maybe it's not as extreme as this, that these sorts of books are more often cited than they're read. And it's actually quite unusual to find an engagement with the argument that Shorty presented, even though everyone talks about the book. You don't very, very seldom find an engagement with what is it that Shorty <coughs> is saying. Um, so let me say a little bit more about the influence of this book. So it's, it's a quite a sort of a classic status in molecular biology because basically most, if not all, of the founders of the new field of molecular biology have credited Schrodinger's What is Life as the key influence that led them to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to enter uh, molecular biology. Many physicists, for example. Uh, so just give some examples of this. Uh, this is uh, Maurice Wilkins, who shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Francis Crick and uh, James Watson for the discovery of the double helix of DNA, saying, during the war I took part in making it, this is actually taken from his Nobel acceptance speech, by the way, uh, 1963, during the war I took part in making the atomic bomb. When the war was ending, I, like many others, he had to be a physicist, cast around for a new field of research. Partly on account of the bomb, I had lots of interest in physics. I was therefore very interested when I read Schrodinger's book, What is Life, I was struck by the concept of a highly complex structure which controlled living processes. Research on such matters seemed more ambitious than solid state physics, and it encouraged me to move into biology. He was the first, but not by far, absolutely not the, not the last. So basically, that entire generation 
founders of Monica Bhaji, after Wilkins made pronouncements about what is life. This is James Watson in 1993, one of his many sort of autobiographical accounts. He says, when I came back to the University of Chicago, he's talking about uh, his time uh, in the 19, mid-1940s, uh, <coughs> I spotted a tiny book, What is Life? In that little gem, Schoen has said that the essence of life was the genie. Up until then, I was interested in birds. But then I thought, well, if the gene is the essence of life, I want to know more about it. And that was painful because otherwise I would have spent my entire life studying birds and nobody would have heard of it. Okay, you need to take these sorts of pronouncements by scientists with a big grain of a rock of salt, maybe. Um, but interesting to see what's wanting to associate himself with Schrodinger and the book. Francis Crick, writing more generally, not about himself, but about the entire generation. This, these, this first generation of American artists. He says, of those who came into the subject just after the war, showing that what his life seems to be particularly influential. The book was extremely well written and conveyed in an exciting way that the idea that in biology molecular explanations would not only be extremely important, but that they're also just around the corner. This had been said before, but showing the book was very timely and attracted people who might otherwise not have entered biology at all. Okay? And one final one from one of the uh, members of the Phage Group um, in Delbrook's Phage Group in Caltech, Gunther Stent, who um, played a big role actually in developing this first historiography of molecular biology. Before the historians got there, the very architects of the field were telling their own histories about molecular biology and writing here very sort of dramatically. Having one of the founding fathers with capital F, so the new physics put the question what is life provided for physicists? an authoritative confrontation with a fundamental problem worthy of their metal. In thus stirring up the passions of this audience, of his audience, sorry, this typo, surely this book became a kind of Uncle Tom's cabin of the revolution in biology that when the dust had cleared, left molecular biology uh, as its legacy. Okay, so you have this, as I say, it's almost sort of mythical statement <coughs> of this book. Okay, and that's been the case really since the 1960s that the book is referred to in this way. Um, this is a letter from the uh, Dublin archives, a very cool letter um, written just after the publication of the Double Helix papers, the, you know, the, 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 the papers by Watson and Crick in 1953 where the structure of the Double Helix was presented. And here you have Francis Crick writing to Schrodinger shortly after. He says, Dear Professor Schrodinger, Watson and I were once discussing how we came to enter the field of molecular biology and we discovered that we have both been influenced by your little book, What is Life? The thought you, um, we thought you might be interested in the enclosed reprints, presumably the reprints uh, from, you know, with this double helix uh, structure. You will see that it looks as though your term aperiodic crystal, which is one of the you know, big terms that Schrodinger introduces or uses in What is Life, is going, to, is going to be very apt. It's going to be a very apt one. So already, you know, Crick is confidently asserting that these ideas are going to become very, uh, very important, and in fact they were. So that's, um, that is sort of the way we can think of the book in, you know, since its publication. Um, recently, right as I've already mentioned, in 2018-2019 we were sort of celebrating the 75th anniversary of the publication of uh, What is Life? And um, we had, for example, people <laughs> writing a retrospect in Nature about What is Life? and uh, Carl Sigmund writing a retrospect in science about what is life, right? And it's all fine as far as it goes. It basically it covers much of the same ground I've just covered now. Uh, what's interesting though is there's very little, if anything, about what the book is saying, apart from saying that it focused the attention on the materiality of genes, but, much, but nothing else really other than that. There was also a huge conference that was organized in Dublin in 2018, Schrodinger at 75, that of course makes no sense because Schrodinger was not 75 in 2018, it was the book. Um, and it was self-styled, as you see here, as a conference on the future of biology. So it's kind of odd, right? You've got all these Nobel laureates coming to speak about the future of biology. And you wonder, well, what is the role, what, what, is, what role is Schrodinger playing here, right? And there is really not much. I mean, many of these are available on YouTube, but if you watch the, the, the keynote lectures that were given, Sometimes surely it will be mentioned in the first slide as having been an important impetus for the development of molecular biology. But again, there's no engagement with the arguments presented in the book, which is kind of odd. 
So uh, that really struck me, and I, then I thought, well, okay, maybe this is maybe this is the situation with the 75th anniversary. Let's look at the 50th anniversary uh, commemoration, celebrations of what is life back in 1994. Maybe those are a little better. And in fact, Cambridge University Press published a whole book on the on the occasion of the 50th anniversary, what it's like for the next 50 years. Again, not about the book, but on the, about the future of biology. Odd. But a conference that you can see here brought together a veritable who is who of the biological theory. We have Stephen Jay Gould, we have John Maynard Smith, we have Lewis Walpert, Kaufman, and also important physicists like Roger Penrose, Walter Tiering, who had been a, a, a personal friend of, uh, of Schrodinger. And apart from Kaufman's chapter, all of the other books, all the other contributions to this volume don't really engage with Schrodinger's Schoen argument. Okay, so that's kind of odd. Okay, so then we might think, so we might approach this by first of all asking, what is it that people know about this book? So if you stop a, a molecular biologist or any biologist in the street and you grab them and say, well, what do you know about what it's like? Tell me, tell me what you know. You're likely to hear something along any combination of these three sort of sound bites. This is what everyone knows about what it's like. Okay, these are, here they are. The first one is, that the hereditary substance, because at the time it hadn't yet been identified as DNA, showing that on advice of Darlington and, and, uh, and Haldane, in the book talks about protein. Um, the identification of DNA as the carrier actually happened the very same year that the lectures happened. The hereditary substance is an apriotic crystal with a code script for development. Lesson one. Lesson two, organisms feed on negative entropy to comply with the second law of thermodynamics. And the third one is that the study of living matter is likely to prompt the discovery of new laws of physics. Okay? <coughs> so, for most people, if they are, if, if what they know about what it's like is probably some combination of the, the, these three ideas. Right? So you may think, if you actually have a book in your hands, that the book is discussing each of these three ideas in more or less relatively equal in a relatively equal amount of attention is devoted to each of these three ideas, but that is not the case, okay? So you take the book, here it is. It's one of these books that uh, thankfully has an analytic table of contents. It tells you after each chapter what, what the chapter is about. I love books like that. Fortunately, we've lost that tradition. It's really kind of nice. So here it is. Here's the book. As you can see, nine less than 100 pages long. And again, I don't know if you can read that, but the interesting thing is that if you've tried to find where in the book Schrodinger is talking about thermodynamics and negative entropy. Actually, it's just a little bit of the penultimate chapter. That's it. Six, seven pages devoted to this idea that organisms feed on negative entropy, which uh, everyone seems to remember. The more interesting thing is that if you actually look when he begins to talk about thermodynamics, he's saying, well, okay, time out, time out, time out. Let's take a break here. Forget everything, as I say here. At the moment that I've been talking about chromosomes and inheritance, and let's just talk about energetics for the next six pages, and that's what he does. He talks about how organisms maintain their stability by bringing, uh, importing matter rich in energy into themselves, and, and so in, in, in therefore doing, they comply with the second law of thermodynamics. There's no real conflict, as it was, had been widely believed in the 19th century, between the second law of thermodynamics and Life, because even though it looks like organisms are highly ordered and they continue to be and they reproduce, and that order seems to be uh, propagated, they only do that by increasing the disorder of the surroundings. They leave a great amount of entropy in their way. To be alive is to, in, to increase the disorder in the universe, because there's no problem there. But as I say, the interesting thing to me is that there is no real, I mean, that this idea is not really related to the main argument. And it gets even worse and more <laughs> interesting when you consider the third claim about new laws, because that's just the beginning of the final chapter, where he talks about maybe um, the study of, um, of life, uh, of, of, uh, of inheritance, uh, living matter, he says, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is, um, is likely to involve other laws of physics, hitherto unknown, which However, once they have been revealed, will form just an integral, integral part of, the, uh, of this science as a former. Now, this has been understood in a wide range of ways. Some people have even accused Schrodinger of being a vitalist because he seems to want to introduce 
uh, other laws of physics. This is something that I'm not <laughs> going to be talking about uh, in my presentation, but I'm very happy to discuss it in the Q&A if you want to hear about the different interpretations of what this idea of new laws of physics actually means, actually entails, okay? So, what does this mean? It means that when we go back to this list, it is really that very first lesson that we need to focus on, because that is where the meat is of the book, okay? So we need to work out what the hell Schrodinger means when he talks about an a periodic crystal, what does he mean by a code script for the dogma? Okay, so let's just go through that. Let's now examine the argument in what it's like to do what everyone should have done, right? And that not very few people actually do to actually find out what it is that he's up to in the book. So, okay, so here's the argument in what is life. First thing to say is that the book is not about life, okay? Shorty is not trying to answer the question, what is life? He's actually trying to answer the question, what is the nature of biological order? That is his question, okay? That's what he's interested in. Uh, interested in, I think, addressing. He begins by saying, well, as a physicist, what would you say about order? The first chapter of the book is called The Classical Physicist Approach to the Subject. If you were a physicist, what do you have to say about order? Well, Schrodinger says that um, physics tells us that, he says, atoms are incapable of exhibiting orderly behavior because they're subject to the stochastic effects of thermal agitation, right? Anything above Absolute zero is going to exhibit this kinetic energy, which means that at the, uh, at the individually, individual atomic level, there's no order. It's very stochastic. There's this jittery. This is often described as brown air motion when it's observable through the microscope, right? So what, it, what that means is the order that emerges in physics only emerges when you consider large ensembles of particles together, right? So you have statistical regularities. Sure, like I said, the physical laws are statistical in nature. Orders, order and regularity can only emerge upon consideration of huge numbers of atoms, molecules, particles, which collectively display macroscopic patterns of order, so you find order at the macroscopic level, as described by the law of large numbers. The larger the number of particles that you consider, the more robust the regular. <coughs> I mean, this is a, an idea that was actually already proposed by, uh, by Planck and others, that most physical laws were statistical, not all of them. So if Planck talks about dynamic laws, such as gravity, but most other laws of physics, and chemistry in fact, are statistical, right, of this nature. So if you want to talk about order as a physicist, you're going to have to be talking about what Schrodinger calls order from disorder, okay? So order emerging at the macroscopic level from a consideration of huge numbers of molecules, atoms, particles, that even though individually exhibit disorder, collectively behave in order. Schrodinger illustrates this in the book. He has a bunch of diagrams in the book. So of course, this is, a, of course, a reference on the way to Boltzmann, who I will return to later, the uh, main intellectual influence on Schrodinger. So he has a bunch of examples here. So if you have, he says, well, if you have fog, right, then collectively the fog uh, will, you can, you can use um, physical principles to describe um, what's going to happen to it. But if you were to consider the, any individual particle in that fog and you were to trace its movement, it's prowling, it's irregular. This is directly taken from the book. So if you have no order considering each individual particle, again, this is fairly familiar stuff, I'm sure, for the physicists among you, but surely it begins by discussing this. Okay? And it gives a bunch of other examples. It talks about diffusion, right? You may not know or be able to predict where each individual particle is going to do, but you can talk about the regularity of the entire ensemble and also the example of paramagnetism as well. These are just examples to illustrate this order from disorder principle. Okay, so far so good. Now, what about life? What about biology? Well, Schrodinger says, well, if you, don't know, if you don't know anything about biology, you may be forgiven for thinking that because life is very ordered, that it's going to exhibit the same sort of order than any physical system, right? You may, you may think it is trivially true that the order of life is also similarly based on macroscopic law-like patterns of behavior exhibited by large ensembles of molecules. This may just be an obvious thing. And here's where the twist comes, because he says, not only is this not trivial, it's actually not true. Okay, so this is the twist in the second chapter of the book called The Hereditary Mechanism, and here's the subtitle, The Classical Physicist Expectation Far From Being Trivial Are <coughs> Okay, so the plot thickens. So if the order is not statistical, what kind of order are we talking about? And here's where Schrodinger draws on the contemporary findings of genetics. We're talking about the work in genetics in the 1930s, experimental work. Um, and he um, argues that it seems to be the case. He says genetics is the most exciting science of our days, he says in the preface. And genetics seems to be telling us 
that the order of life of an organism is essentially determined by its genes. It's a very different kind of order from the, from the idea of order that is familiar to the physicist, he says. He says, drawing on work that had been done <coughs> on X-ray mutagenesis of Drosophila in the 1930s, experimental evidence, says Schrodinger, shows that a gene molecule only has about a few thousand atoms. He says it seems to be the case we can, we can actually uh, calculate the size of genes. And it seems that the, the size is too small, he says, from the law of large numbers point of view, to entail an orderly and lawful behavior according to statistical physics. What is he saying? He's saying, look, genes are too small to be able to appeal as a physicist to order from disorder, to make sense of how order emerges in life. That's not going to work here. We need something else. I mean, and this is weird, right? It's strange. Since genes are so small, they should not uh, be able to reliably code for heritable traits, given that they are firmly in the ripple form of adaptation. If you're a physicist or you're a chemist, it would be very strange to think of a molecule who, which we know is going to be subject to this stochastic motion, to, to think that such a molecule would be uh, able to code reliably code for traits. So this seems really odd, and yet we, it must be true. It seems to be the case, right? Empirical evidence seems to suggest that genes are remarkably stable, Schrodinger says, with a durability and or permanence that borders upon the miraculous. This is uh, directly taken from, uh, this is the Schrodinger's words. So you should think of the book as an attempt to solve this paradox. That's what the book is about. The book is an attempt to answer this question. How do we reconcile the small size of genes with their extraordinary stability in the face of constant stochastic perturbations. It should not be possible for entities as small as the genes to be able to be orderly, and yet it seems to be the case that they are. How do we solve this paradox? And here's where Schrodinger uses his uh, extraordinary powers of reasoning to basically argue almost from the armchair uh, for how this, to do, uh, not to resolve this paradox, okay? So he actually illustrates this as a good Viennese that he is. He gives the example of the Habsburg family, right, uh, to just illustrate the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the miraculous stability of genes. So had the, many members of the Habsburg family had this sort of protruded jaw. It came to be known as the Habsburg lip or the Habsburg jaw. Schrodinger says, you know, if you walk around the uh, galleries in Vienna and you look at these portraits, what you'll find is that this, this genetically determined trait is found in members of the Habsburg royal family, you know, from Charles V, born in 1500, to Archduke, uh, um, I don't remember his name right now, but he would die at the late of the 19th century. We're talking about 400 years, right? Where you have something that is determined by a molecule that is sufficiently stable that you actually can see it. And these are, these are not, you know, this is a photograph, but these are the rest of them are paintings, and they're supposed to be painted in an attractive light, you know, so you don't get your head cut off. And yet, you can see, right? They're just real veritable freaks of nature. So, so this is just an illustration that he gives in the book for the remarkable, miraculous stability of a molecule that is capable of being stable in the light of stochastic perturbations for four centuries. So, how does he solve the paradox? Well, he reasons that the genetic material has to have this extremely rigid structure. Um, he uh, thinks it has to be a sort of a, a crystal. We know now, of course, that DNA is a polymer, but the idea of a crystal is intended to reflect this incredible rigidity, rigidity and stability of the atoms that make it up. Okay? Uh, it has to be that way in order to withstand the disruptive effects of random motion. And moreover, quantum mechanics provides the foundation for that stability because it is the theory of the covalent, <coughs> of the covalent bond developed by, uh, by Heitler, who is one of the people who work with Schrodinger, that, that provided, that explains how something can be so stable. Right? But it's not just any crystal, of course, it has to contain information. Of course, surely it doesn't use the word information, that would only enter biology, um, well, about, uh, about a decade after. He, but, he, but clearly that's what he means. He says, well, it needs to be able to display some sort of a periodic configuration so that it can contain within it a specification of development for what's going to be the microscopic system. Okay? So that's why he thinks the genetic material has to be an a periodic crystal. Okay? That's why Crick said in his letter, your term a periodic crystal is going to be a very apt one. Right? Because Schrodinger is reasoning from first principles that 
the, uh, you know, the hereditary material is going to have, he says, the properties of a solid. Now, of course, it makes no sense from a physical perspective to talk about a molecule as being a solid or a gas, or whether these are, um, these are properties of, 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 of microscopic uh, you know, properties. But he calls them a priori crystal, a priori solid, to illustrate how important it is that we understand that they're able to withstand any sort of, uh, any sort of jittering from the environment. Okay. And he says, well, this is a new form of order. It's, it's, it's an order that, that we have got a, a way of, a, of attaining order that we don't find in, in physics, um, but we do actually find in machines, he says. Okay? So there's something that, that connects the orderly structure and behavior of organisms with machines that we create, but not with any other physical system. And that's why he concludes what is life by drawing that familiar analogy between life the living and the mechanical, right? It goes all the way back to Descartes. But Schrodinger says, don't accuse me of being some simple-minded mechanist, okay? I'm talking about clockwork here. He says life is like clockwork because of the, um, you know, that, that's, that rigidity that is guaranteed by quantum mechanics um, that, that hinges, also hinges upon a solid, right? Machines are solid. The aperiodic crystal is also a solid. Um, and, and that's the only way in which we can understand it of being largely withdrawn from the disorder of heat motion. Okay? So, what picture do we get of, of nature? We get a picture where you have two ways of getting at order, of, of producing order. The order from disorder principle and the order from order principle that is going to be uh, fundamental for the new biology. Okay? Excellent. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the book. Now I want to begin the process of well, first I'm going to begin by evaluating these two principles, right? From the, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, 80 years later, what can we say about these two ideas, order from order and order from disorder? Okay, let's begin with the order from order <laughs> idea. Um, well, the first thing to say is, of course, that, um, you know, in, showing this, in, in the book, the principle, as I say, <coughs> accounts for the transmission of biological order, okay? So it explains how order is transmitted. Uh, in the hereditary code script, okay? Now, because Schrodinger uses the term code script, many people have assumed or have uh, credited Schrodinger for the idea of a genetic code, which then became very important to molecular biology. Now, I think this is problematic, and a lot of people have actually missed this, but it's problematic because the notion of code has more than one meaning, right? Code can mean, can refer to sort of a cipher, when you have a translation of one language into another. And that's what the genetic code is, by the way. But a code can, only, can also be some sort of plan, when you talk about the highway code, for example, sort of a set of instructions. And I would argue that this is exactly the way in which the notion of code is used by Schrodinger. Okay? So that's the first thing to note, that it has often been missed, okay? that the code script in Schrodinger's work does not involve a translation of a message, as you do in molecular biology, where you have DNA to RNA to protein, but rather it's a plan. He's talking about a plan. Preformation, a preformation is planned. Something that is a set of rules, right, in the hereditary code that governs and controls the production of macroscopic order. Okay? So in that respect, what is what Schrodinger is anticipating is not the idea of the genetic code, but the idea of the genetic program, right? Which was coin proposed by François Jacob and Jacques Bonnard and Smyer in 1961, <coughs> 15 years later. And it is that idea of the genetic program that it seems to be anticipated by Schrodinger's writings. Now, now, if you're familiar with the literature today, this notion of a genetic program, the idea that development is basically is the result of, uh, of an execution of a programmatic set of instructions, is a very problematic one. In early work, in my own work, I've actually criticized this idea um, according, uh, due, due to the fact that it sort of proposes three very problematic theses about development. Okay, here they are. neo preformationism <laughs> genetic animism, developmental computability. What do I mean by this? Well, the idea of neo preformationism is quite familiar. It's the idea that developmental information, the information for development, is fully encoded in the genes. Call that you know, neo preformationism because it's a reference to the preformationist ideas of animal generation that were popular in the 17th century. Genetic animism, what does that mean? Well, it means that, that it seems to be the case often that biologists ascribe agency to genes. Genes are not just storing information, they're getting things done. 
right? They are, they are the, the agents, right? They initiate, direct, and control the developmental process. Again, very problematic, right? How to very problematic to describe an agency to a chemical molecule. Developmental computability, well, that's the idea that has been proposed by a number of developmental biologists. We run the only ones, like Lewis Walpert, um, that if you had all the knowledge of what's <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the genome and you knew the initial conditions, you'd be able to compute development. So you know, Walpert has a paper in Science from 1994 called Can We Compute Development? You know, Rosenberg followed up saying, absolutely yes, most other philosophers about it thought that was a very problematic idea. Why am I mentioning this? Why am I mentioning this? Because if you look at the book and you look at when the term code script is being used, what you're going to find is that Schrodinger is using the term to defend these three claims. Let me just illustrate that very quickly. So here it is, it's used seven times. So when he's talking about the code script as, codif as containing the entire pattern of the individual's future development, he's clearly advocating or endorsing this new information view. Right? He talks about here in the code as a highly complex specified <laughs> plan. When he talks about uh, you know, what about genetic animism? Well, he seems to be saying not only is that, not only is the genetic material a law code, but also it's executive power, right? Or to use another simile, architects plan and build this craft in one. It's not just, it doesn't just have the information, it's actually getting things done, it's making things happen. Again, very problematic, but for me what's interesting is that these ideas you already find 15 years before Jacob Amono even considered the idea of a genetic program. It's already in trouble. Okay, and the last one, this deterministic idea, uh, any, I mean, I, I'm sure you can guess who is mentioned, <coughs> Laplace is demon, of course, as always is the case, and it's mentioned in Schrodinger's book. In calling the structure of the chromosome 5 as a code script, we mean that the all-penetrating mind, one conceived by Laplace, to which every causal connection lay immediately open, could tell from their structure whether the egg would develop into a black cock, speckled hen, fly, mains, plant, polyhedron, beetle, mouse, woman. Very, very, very explicitly deterministic, preformationist, and ascribing genes to this sort of animism. Okay, so that's what we can say retrospectively about 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 Schrodinger's engagement, right? That he's already anticipating not just the ideas, right, but also the pitfalls of these ideas that only now we're realizing are not appropriate for thinking about development. But to be fair to Schrodinger, of course, we have to recognize that he was right in recognizing that there is a stream of order, right, from DNA of the parent to DNA of the offspring. That seems to be right. There seems to be an order from order principle at work in morphogenesis, and of course it's connected to the hereditary substance. But, as I've already argued, he was wrong to, uh, to localize in this substance all the information required to specify the organism, of course, because the environment plays an important role, right? So neo-preformationism is wrong, and he was wrong to not realize that. And even also to invest it with a causal power to get stuff done, to initiate control, direct development. Okay? And um, why was it wrong? Well, because DNA does nothing alone. We know that now. DNA does nothing on its own. The only reason why it has its remarkable properties is because we've got all these other molecules, all this other machinery, although I, I have a shiver every time I use that metaphor, that is helping the DNA you know, try and trans uh, faithfully try and transcribe and translate the message, right? It's the cell as a whole that has that activity. Even the stability, the stability that, that fascinated Schrodinger is not an intrinsic property of the DNA. It's an accomplishment of the entire cell. So every time the DNA is, um, is replicated, there are replicated there are errors. You've got all this machinery to ensure that these enzymes that work very hard to ensure that, that, that those errors are eliminated. So it just shows that we actually need to think of the context of the cell as a whole to make sense of this paradox. But once we do, the paradox disappears. Um, just mentioned here a nice book by uh, Lenny Moss, What Genes Can't Do, that, that develops these ideas very nicely. Um, so as I say, this modern cell biology, we can say, resolves Schrodinger's paradox of the gene. And of course, there's the other point, right, that when you have cell division, it's not just the DNA that is passed on, it's everything else that is passed on, and some of it can have an influence on the phenotype. So you need to account for extra genetic inheritance. Extra genetic inheritance is a lovely book by um, someone else I've worked with, Dr. Um, Longer and Lamb, a very famous, well-known book in the philosophy of biology, evolution and four dimensions that developed this idea. All right, so far so good. So let's talk now about the order from disorder principle. Now you may think, well, what am I going to say here? Surely, surely, surely I was right about that, because he's talking about, about the principle 
as a, you know, a principle that is well known in physics. And of course, I can't uh, say anything about that, surely. Um, right, um, but what we can say, of course, historically, is that the principle reflects the transformation of physical law, the statistical transformation of physical law that was brought about by Boltzmann and others, the statistical mechanics of what were developed, uh, developed by Boltzmann and others. And of course, that's correct as far as it goes. What is more problematic is to suggest that it plays no role in life. In wanting to distinguish clearly order from order and order from disorder, and say order from disorder, super important in physics, but plays no role in biology, I think Schrodinger is deliberately, as I will argue later, um, you know, misconstruing um, how, how order arises in, in, in the living world. Why? Because you can find statistical regularities everywhere in nature. You know, the work of Charles here uh, illustrates that very clearly. I mean, the, the statistical uh, revolution also impacted biology. And, you, know, you can think of the entire you know, population genetics revolution as being uh, important in, in, in that idea, right? Even also Mendel's principles of inheritance, right? So in many areas of biology, knowledge of individuals is derived from the study of large populations. That is not a foreign, unfamiliar idea to our biologists. So it seems really odd, and I will explain why I, uh, he does this. It seems really odd that Schrodinger wants to say these sorts, this notion of order is, doesn't play a role in life. <coughs> so just a, just a very quick here uh, quote from Barry Fisher, who had been influenced uh, very much by Boltzmann, you know, talking about, about his, his, uh, his whole investigation as being comparable to the theory of gases, right? very directly saying that you can, you know, the same sort of principle, the same sort of statistical approach applies in his work as it does in physics. Okay, so again, really odd that Schrodinger would want to exclude this form of order in life. And we don't even need to appeal to populations. Just even in development, even in cell biology, in areas where it seems less likely that statistics are going to play a role, you find direct engagement. This is a very nice paper from 2012, which I like, which has actually the idea of, of developing a statistical mechanics of self fate decisions, and I have it because um, there's this wonderful sort of comparison of statistical mechanics with, uh, with the process of self differentiation, and then maybe in balance, what we need to do is look at how physicists work with this notion of order from disorder and develop the corresponding equations that will enable us to determine you know, what happens, how you have, how from a seemingly stochastic bundle of cells you get an organized differentiated embryo at the end of it. Okay. So, um, and you know, and the other thing, of course, is that statistical regularities are not the only way to get order from disorder. Now, we know that you have things like self-organization, far from experimental thermodynamics. Ilya Prigogin being the, the you know, sort of the, the hero in this in this in this branch of, of physics, right? Where you have where you recognize that uh, in, in physics, it doesn't have to be only in life. You have uh, dissipative structures that are able to maintain order uh, in a steady state, in an irreversible steady state, and actually that's exactly the same sort of uh, principle that applies to biology. Now, biologists have been a little bit slower in the uptake, but increasingly you find more engagement with the notion of self-organization also in biology. This is a very nice paper in 2008 called Self-Organization in Cell Biology, and if you're interested, I've, I've written up, uh, about this, you know, that increasingly we are realizing that more and more organelles in the cell actually are dissipative structures, and that we need to appeal to this kind of physics to make sense of them. Genetic order just won't do, because there is no template. There's no genetic template for much of the architecture in the cell. Interesting. This is a sort of a relatively new discovery. And, you know, some people have argued, and this again, I won't discuss this in more detail, we can return to this in the Q&A, that Schrodinger came close to this realization when he talked about negative entropy, right? In those six pages, he talks about how the system is maintaining its order by maintaining energy. That's kind of close to the notion of a, of a pre virginian dissipative structure. But Schrodinger never talks about, far from my memory, but more importantly, never considers this as a source of order, right? So it is inappropriate to credit Schrodinger with this. And yet people have done this, and right? if you are interested in this, I can return to that. Okay, so I want to move now on to the uh, legacy, right? How we think about Schrodinger's what is life today. Now, there seems to be an interesting, um, you know, sort of interesting situation here because historians seem to have agreed on something. Historians don't usually agree on anything. There seems to be a consensus which emerged in the 1990s that actually there's no reason to look at this book at all. 
There's no reason to engage in the book. Maybe this explains why it is that people don't talk about the argument. Why is there no reason to engage in the book? Well, because most of the accounts of the influence of the book were actually you know, provided 20 years after the fact. And historians say you should not trust scientists when they're telling their own narrative autobiographies, right? So the book may be helpful to understand you know, the, the, the process of discipline building, you know, or how, how to <coughs> legitimize a discipline, because that seems to have been what has happened. Uh, that what seems to happen, and these were the quotations that I have for you at the beginning, Schrodinger seems to come up as a way to give legitimacy to the new biology by associating this new biology with one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. You know? So it seems like his name is being uh, you know, drawn on to give legitimacy to molecular biology, and there's nothing really about the argument that matters. So the consensus, historical consensus today, if you ask any historian of biology today, they will probably tell you, yeah, okay, what is life? Um, it conveyed excitement, it brought focus, but really no scientific value of its own. The reason why that is also the consensus is because on commemorating the uh, centenary of the birth of Schrodinger in 1987, a book came out which brought together a number of authors to discuss the legacy of Schrodinger. And what was really interesting and surprising is that the chapters, there were two chapters that discussed Schrodinger's contribution to biology, and the two authors, Max Perutz and Linus Pauling, huge names, both lambasted Schrodinger and said there's nothing of value. So here is Perutz being particularly mean about Schrodinger, saying, a close study of what is life has shown me that what was true in this book was not original, and most of what was original was not known to be true, even when the book was written. Damn. <laughs> Pauling. When I first read What Is Life over 40 years ago, I was disappointed. It was, and still is, my opinion that Schrodinger made no contribution to understanding life. Now, of course, Pauling goes on to say that in providing quantum mechanics and, and, and a theory of the, of the covalent bond, he provided the foundation for chemistry. And in providing the foundation for chemistry, he also provided the foundation for, for biology. But as far as the book's argument are concerned, we should not pay attention. And I think this is the reason why no one reads the book anymore. At least no one reads the book to work out what he said anymore. And that's what I'm trying to sort of push against it, because I think this is wrong. I think that if you consider the argument, I presented it to you, it's not a complicated argument about cellular order. What you find is that in the, so his argument is, and I'll just re re remind you, that the source of cellular order is in this fixed solid state crystal, okay? That provides this, that it's the structure of the genetic material. Uh, and in doing so, it renders the, the material impervious to stochastic forces. Now, if you think about this more than one minute, you're going to realize right, that this order that is encoded in the, in the genome is going to have to be transmitted to the proteins, the workforces of the cell. So the order encoded in the crystal has to be reliably transmitted to the cell's components so that these can individually express it through their actions in a way also that similarly eludes the, uh, you know, or overcomes the browning storm of the molecular wheel. What does this mean? It means if you've got an embryonic crystal that has to be a crystal so that it can maintain its order, surely all the other molecules that are doing things in the cell to generate the phenotype of the cell are also going to have to be in some sense fixed and rigid. So what I want to suggest is that the true legacy of the book is in convincing biologists that most of these uh, components of the cell have to be understood and have to be studied as rigid, fixed, macromolecules, okay, and that we don't have to worry about stochasticity, right, that they can elude or overcome stochastic forces. So here is my hypothesis, what I'm suggesting, should we understand as the legacy, the influence of this idea, this idea here, granted molecular biologists the license to dismiss the effects of stochasticity on subcellular process, and that's exactly what you find, by the way, until recently, no one is talking about stochasticity. Got these beautiful diagrammatic descriptions of molecular processes. It looks like it's a, you know, it's completely removed from the milieu in which these molecules exist, which is of course a stochastic milieu. Allowing them to focus on the structure of the macromolecules, drawing attention to the crystal-like rigidity, of course, through methods like X-ray crystallography that actually work with crystals of these proteins, right? Emphasizing their functional specificity like it would you would in a machine and ignoring the deep stabilizing influences of the microscopic environment. I think this is what we should think about when we think about the influence of Lewis life. The fact that it was okay 
to think about the cell and its components in this way. So, these are just some examples of how this has been, uh, you know, come to, a, to life. This is an example from, um, you know, a very, very important uh, lab in, in, in Caltech, Eric Davidson's work on gene regulatory networks. What you're seeing here is the, uh, the pathways that lead to the differentiation of the seed urchin embryo. And it's not a coincidence that this looks like a circuit, like an electronic circuit diagram. It's deliberately represented in this way. You have seemingly Boolean networks that enable you to say, well, what's going to happen when this gene will react with this other gene? This is completely standard, by the way, uh, when you look at developmental genetics today. A physicist who doesn't know anything about biology, the first thing they're going to say is, well, this is really weird because you're not considering here the scale at which these reactions are happening. There's no room for stochasticity here. It's giving you a view which everything seems to be determined. It's a deterministic view. And it's a preformationist view as well. And it's not just gene relative networks, by the way. Any metabolic pathways, right? This is a classic way you may want to think about certain pathways in the cell. They tend to be also represented in the technical literature, by the way, technical literature, as nodes in the circuit. Solid state, just like Schrodinger thought. If you go to the biology department here, I'm sure you will find metabolic diagrams of this kind, you know, as posters on the wall, right? We teach this to students. We say, you know, what are the metabolic pathways in the cell? And we show to students things like this. Now, of course, this is a terrible, well, I mean, it's a one way to represent what's going on, but it's, it's very misleading because, of course, each of these nodes, which are the proteins, are able, like in the cell, are free in the cell, they're not fixed to any circuit board, and they stochastically interact with many binding partners. This is only showing one possible way of potentially infinite number of ways in which the molecules represented here can potentially interact. Specificity, it turns out, in molecular biology is actually the exception, not the norm. And even when I was a student, it wasn't that long ago when I studied molecular biology, I was told, for example, that enzymes are effective catalyzers precisely because they're super specific. And yet it turns out that most molecules can actually interact with many, many other molecules. This is a this comes as a surprise in molecular biology. Why a surprise? Because we have this idea that, that molecules are supposed to be fixed and rigid and specific. Okay? When you actually look at the literature, at the empirical literature, what you find are things like this. This is what we call a horror, horror graph, because it shows, first of all, in black, the textbook representation. And green and red are the actual empirical observations of how these molecules interact with one another. What you find is so much mess, so much crosstalk here, which of course poses an interesting question: How do we represent this stuff? I mean, if this is really what's going on, I maybe mean, we shouldn't be look, we shouldn't be teaching students this. I'm not engaged with this here. I've spoken about the problems with this and the potential um, solutions or alternatives in other work. What I mean, I'm interested in here. What I want to get you to understand is that this, I think, is a consequence, and it's partly of the arguments presented in the world's life, despite the fact that no other historian seems to have suggested this. So you may be thinking, okay, 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 but I mean, surely you can't link all of this to Schrodinger. I mean, why Schrodinger? This seems to be a bit of a stretch. Well, here's where, you know, I put my sort of historian's hat on and I go around the archives investigating, look, seeing if I can find some evidence of Schrodinger's name being used in the work of these important molecular biologists uh, and, and to see whatever it is really showing who's being the influence here. And actually, uh, with the help, I have to say, from Laurent Moison in Paris, is able to find some direct evidence, at least in the case of Jacques Monod in the, uh, in the archives in Paris, to suggest, well, to show, really, because it's, it's quite clear the evidence is, is indisputable, really, that Monod changed his mind in the 1950s, having had originally a statistical view in order to a more mechanistic, deterministic clockwork view in order, as a consequence of really showing which is amazing, okay? Now, Monod is well known for this book, Chance and Necessity, published in 1970. The, the, the subtitle was a natural history, uh, you know, philosophy for molecular biology. It was like a sort of a manifesto of the new view of the cell, and it's a very deterministic view that he proposes, right? It's a view that is really showing uh, what it's like, right? Well, and of course, there he doesn't mention Schrodinger. But in the archives, I was able to find in some lecture notes of some talks he gave uh, in 1956, uh, discussing, so he says, this is 1956, okay? He says, the whole trend of modern molecular biology makes it every day clear that structural stability and rigidity, rather than dynamicity, are the most essential and characteristic properties of the typical cellular 
macromolecules. Forget about metabolism, forget about energetics, forget about dynamic equilibrium. It's going to be stability and rigidity that we need to focus on, he says. Good. What about Schrodinger? What does he come in? Well, here we have it. Schrodinger, with an insight of genius, he says in his lecture, had perceived this as a necessary attribute for the hereditary material. Schrodinger showed us the way. Now, it's not just DNA, he says. It's also not just limited to DNA. We know from recent work that RNA also has to be super stable, and also proteins, which is actually the goal of Warnow's lecture from 56. So this seems to be kind of nice. Of course, it's just one example, but a very prominent one, because even though you may not think that many people read Schrodinger, surely lots of people also read Warnow. So you can talk about its secondary influence. Interesting. OK, so let me give you one more quote, which is super nice also from the archives, he says he's talking about the ribosome. He says even when you consider a ribosome, the protein synthesizing process, the process, right? So he says appears to be working with very high precision. And the concept of micro heterogeneity, the fact that you know you have different so it doesn't seem to be important. You know, fluctuations, we don't need these things unwarranted. Putting it otherwise, even in the formation of such large complex molecule like a protein, the synthesizing system appears to work mechanically like a clock or a precision machine tool rather than statistically, and you can't think of an example. <laughs> but then he has Schrodinger here, parenthesis, to remind himself to say that in the lecture. Now, what's interesting is that if you open uh, a scientific journal today and you look at how today people think about the ribosome, you know what you get? The exact opposite view of this. We've had to unlearn the lessons, right? What we're learning is that the ribosome is behaving actually not mechanically. That most of the things it does actually do not contribute to the function. So this is a nice paper from uh, Peter Morse. So this is 1958, right? And what about 2012? You've got this paper from uh, uh, Peter Moore at Yale. How should we think about the ribosome? It's actually talking about these virtual animations. And you know, he says, he says, you know, it's very, very problematic to use snapshots of the ribosome to work out the function because that's not how it works. You know, the ribosome isn't a machine. It doesn't help to think about macromolecules as molecular machines. The use of the word machine in this context is pernicious. It's the implication that the functional properties of macromolecules can be explained mechanically. That everything that the ribosome does is a consequence of mechanical direction. And that's simply not true. Why? Because it's just not possible to have those sorts of processes at, at, at a scale <coughs> where stochasticity reigns supreme. So I just want to have this contrast here on the slide to show you what a difference 50 years makes. And that we've had to sort of come full circle, as it were. We've had to sort of go back to the view we had before Schrodinger. And I think this provides interesting evidence for the hypothesis I'm suggesting. All right, so now, another objection you may have. Well, I mean, is this really fair to Schrodinger? I mean, we're all, after all, we're, we're talking here uh, 80 years after the fact. Is it, is it fair to retrospectively you know, blame Schrodinger for having had these ideas. You know, maybe he didn't know enough. Maybe, after all, he was a physicist. Oh, what did he know about biology? Surely, I mean, maybe this is not right to want to say that Schrodinger is responsible for anything. Well, let me just remind you of what, have I, what I have presented to you today so far in terms of arguments, right? What have I said Schrodinger is responsible for? Three things. These are the three things. Genocentrism, the idea that the genes, the heritage material has all the information. I've also suggested that Schrodinger uh, is responsible for denying the fact that statistical regularities play any role in biology. And I've also suggested that Schrodinger is responsible for essentially giving biologists, more likely about this, the license to dismiss the influence of stochasticity in the process of the Now, you may be thinking, is this fair? Is this, is this OK, or am I going too far here? Is this blaming Schrodinger for not knowing the future? Are there unfair criticisms posed with the benefit of hindsight? What I want to show to you in what remains of, of my talk is that it's definitely not unfair. That Schrodinger knew exactly what he was doing when he presented these three ideas. Also, moreover, that he didn't have to defend these three ideas. There were many op options available to him, and he chose to defend these views. These were, this was not the consensus view in biology at the time. OK, so I want to show this to you now, what's left. OK, so none, as I say, none of these claims are inevitable. The genesis of what it's like reveals that they reflect deliberate choices by Schrodinger. So, what are we going to do now? Well, in this final part of the talk, we need to get into <coughs> why Schrodinger wrote this book in the first place. Let's do a little bit more historical investigation and find out how he came to want to, you know, to, if it is really true that he had in mind the argument of these three ideas, and also why. Why was Schrodinger interested in defending this? Let's see if we can answer this question, okay? So, if you look at the literature, 
and you, you, know, you look, for example, at the biography of Schrodinger, and you ask the question, why a 56-year-old physicist, right? Why did he turn his attention to biology? What the hell's going on here? Why did he do that? Right? He could have discussed any topic. Well, Walter Moore, his biographer, says, well, you know, his dad was an amateur botanist. Maybe, you know, he was interested in, in botany, and so he had an interest in, 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 in biology all his life, right? That could be one possible explanation. Um, Evelyn Fox Keller and Lily Kay show that Schrodinger was obsessed as an undergraduate student at the University of Vienna with this book, Now Forgotten, by Richard Simon, the meme as conservation principle that discussed the idea of cellular memory. And so maybe this explains his interest in, in biology from an early age. Possible. Stephen Jay Gould, in his contribution to this 50th anniversary publication that I showed you at the beginning, suggests that maybe it has to do with this intellectual milieu that Schrodinger was brought up in. You know, the Vienna uh, of the beginning of the 20th century, where you have this sort of, sort of aspiration to sort of a unity of science, to, to seek sort of common principles. And finally, one of his students, John Simmons, basically says, well, look, this guy was a Renaissance man. He was interested in many things. He just went from one topic to another, to another, to another. After all, he wrote top you know, paper books about you know, science and, and the Greeks. He wrote poetry, published poetry books, and all kinds of things. So maybe just that's, that's it. There's no more to that. I'm not convinced, and I want to hopefully show to you why you shouldn't be convinced by any of these explanations either. I think that the real reason why Schrodinger is interested in biology has to do with what was going on in physics. And I think the reason why people haven't noticed this before is that there are only two kinds of people who talk about what it's like. You have historians of biology and historians of physics. The historians of biology usually don't know much about what was going on in physics in the periods that they look at, and the historians of physics don't usually understand. <coughs> so there's been sort of mismatch, right? So we need to bring these together. So let's have a look a bit at the physical context to make sense of what's going on. Well, so here's my idea, right? This is my conviction that we can make sense, we cannot make sense of showing his engagement about it without understanding his position in the heated debates uh, about theoretical physics that took place during the interwar period that Schrodinger was involved in. Okay? So what do we know about that? Well, we know that Schrodinger, by the mid-30s, was almost a marginal figure. He was at odds with basically almost, most of his physics con contemporaries, with the exception of Albert Einstein, who co he corresponded with. Why? Because he rejected the increasingly prevalent orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. He never accepted this view of quantum mechanics. He thought this was an aberration. That this is, he had his deterministic wave equation, and, you know, and Born, and Heisenberg, and Jordan had taken it and statisticalized and basically destroyed the beauty of this, of this equation. He talks about this as I, show, as I will show in a moment. Right? So, um, so, right, the equation, showing this wave equation is deterministic, and yet the interpretation that was given to it by Bohr and Heisenberg is not. And Schrodinger never accepted this interpretation. It led him to become progressively more marginalized, as I've already said, from the physical orthodoxy of his day. These are just some fun quotes from the archives where you see Heisenberg being really mean to Schrodinger and correspondence. The more I ponder the physical parts of Schrodinger's theory, the more abhorrent I find it. What Schrodinger writes about the visualizability of his theory, I find it crap. <laughs> Schrodinger, for his part, talks about the damned Gottingen people, referring to Heisenberg and Jordan, are using my beautiful wave mechanics to compute the shitty little matrix. Right? This is, of course, a translation from the German, because I think it's an accurate translation. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. It's very, very heated, okay? He's engaged in these debates, and he's in, in the marginals and losing this debate, right? So, uh, I mean, this is another quote where he actually one known quote from, from the archives that we're going to have to stick to this damn quantum jumps, and I regret that I ever had anything to do with quantum theory, Schrodinger says. And it is only by understanding this that you can understand why in 1935 he wrote this very famous paper, The Present Status of Quantum Mechanics, where, he's, where he proposed this uh, famous cat thought experiment, which is tragically misunderstood. People think of the cat thought experiment as a as a way of, um, you know, as, as a way to show that Schrodinger was defending this bizarreness of quantum mechanics, when in fact it was, he intended it as a reduction ad absurdum argument. He suggested, well, it makes no sense, right? We only need to think of what would happen if you could amplify a quantum effect at the microscopic level to realize that it's absolutely crazy to say that the cat is in a state of superposition being alive and dead until you observe it. It makes no sense to say that. So he writes to Einstein saying, I got it, yeah. 
I've got this, this going to show how absurd it is, and the exact opposite happened, of course. You know, it became a poster child for the Copenhagen interpretation. It's the tragedy, right? If you ask those people on the street what they know about Schrodinger, they won't even mention his wave mechanics. They won't mention the cat, which Schrodinger hoped would eliminate, sort of remove this Copenhagen interpretation, which, of course, he didn't do. Okay, so this is, I argue, important background to understand what he's up to in life. And let's now get into that, okay? So, um, so what's really interesting about Schrodinger is that he really can be thought of as the last classical physicist in the sense that he never lost that sort of unwavering commitment to determinism. Even if it was a, a statistical kind of determinism, but it's still a deterministic picture that he had all his life. And this is partly a consequence if you, if any, if you, bear, if you, not, if you take, take the effort to look at his, his biography, his obsession with Boltzmann and the sort of Vienna school, right, that he that was so influential on him. This is a quote, I think, um, from his autobiography that I think uh, makes it very clear. This is the old Vienna Institute, which had just, so I didn't mention this, but Schrodinger hoped to study with Boltzmann. And the same year that he entered university, the summer before the start of term, she was Boltzmann, who was rather depressed and had just committed suicide in Dresden. So he was taught by Boltzmann students. The old Vienna Institute, which had just borne the tragic loss of Ludwig Boltzmann, the building where Fritz Hassan Earl and Franz Exler carried out the work, these are the two. Uh, sort of most important influences on you know, people actually to uh, influence physicists and influence uh, Schrodinger's view, um, gave me a direct insight into the ideas which had been formulated by that great mind. His line of thought may be called, he says, my first love in science, no other has ever thus enraptured me or will ever do so again. Okay, so you've got this oh, called commitment right to Boltzmann. So it seems to be the case that what Schrodinger is basically up to, right, that his allegiance is really not with quantum mechanics, right, but with actually this Austrian sort of school of statistical mechanics, which was represented by Boltzmann, Exxon, and Hasenow, which was the view which recognized the importance of statistical regularities, even recognized that they may, we may need to be skeptical about whether determinism is ontological or not, but that guaranteed a deterministic picture of the end of the day, microscopically speaking because the regularities of physics allowed us to have that picture, right? So what I want to suggest, actually, is that the reason why Schrodinger turned to biology, the reason why he got interested in biology, is because he hoped that he would find there a way to salvage this mechanicist, determinist worldview that he had, you know, been brought up with, the classical physics, that he had become progressively undermined by the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. I think this is what's going on, okay? He's trying to protect or, you know, salvage this view that seems to be eroded completely by physics by suggesting that maybe in biology you have a reason to defend this sort of deterministic view. Okay, so again, this is the hypothesis that I have. So let me just give you a couple of reasons why I think this is a compelling hypothesis. First of all, it's kind of interesting to note that Schrodinger decided his answer to what is life, his arguments, a decade before the publication of the book. It's simply not true that in 1942, he said, okay, well, I'm going to do the next six sets of lectures about, of, uh, on biology. He had been brewing and thinking, just like Darwin had been thinking about his theory for many, many years before he wrote What is Life? In Schrodinger's case, in a decade. Why do we know that? I will show you, I will give you the evidence in a moment. Um, I think that the critics are right, you know, those who say that What is Life is not representative of biology at the time, are right, I think, but for the wrong reasons. They're right, they're wrong, they're, they're right because Schrodinger actually wasn't trying to advance biology with what is life. That was not his goal. He was not intending to advance debates in biology. In fact, he was, a, he was intending to advance a particular debate in physics that I will get to in a moment. Schrodinger's biological argument, which is strongly deterministic, I suggest, was simply a tool, a means to an end, namely the defense of a general deterministic worldview. This has one particular important implication which has to do with free will. So at the time you have physicists already arguing that maybe there's a connection between the indeterminism of quantum mechanics and free will. And that's the way we should make that connection. Now, surely we have absolutely despised this. He tried to suggest that this was not quite right uh, and actually suggest that quantum indeterminacy <coughs> actually uh, pro cannot be used to provide a foundation for free will. I think this is actually what's going on. And the moment you realize that you have this in your head, you will never read that book in the same way. You will see it everywhere. And I will, I will, get, I will get to it in a moment. So, let's go back to the book. Remember, what was the subtitle? What did it say here? The physicist approached the subject with an epilogue on determinism and free will. 
That's what he added at the end of the book after the lectures, the thing that really annoyed the Irish publisher, which is why he had to go to Cambridge University Press for the publication of his book. Now, the interesting thing is, so this is what he says actually in the epilogue, it's a four page epilogue. He says, To the physicist, I wish to emphasize that in my opinion, and contrary to the opinion of held in some quarters, he's referring here specifically to the work of people like Pascual Jordan, who was suggesting this idea. Quantum indeterminacy plays no biologically relevant role in the activity of the organism. He says this. Okay, when he talks about it. If you want to argue for free will, don't use science. This is the wrong way of arguing. And don't use physics, and definitely don't use a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics that is already wrong. In, 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 in his correspondence, he talks about the Copenhagen twaddle, the Copenhagen um, fluff. He is very, very critical of Bohr and, and, and this interpretation. Now, the irony, of course, is that the, the reviewers of the book, people like Haldane, thought it was a ridiculous epilogue because he talks about how he, you know, you know it's, it's, he, he says, <laughs> Haldane with his own sort of dry remarks, he says, a mechanist must either give a mechanistic account of life or turn a some sort. In his epilogue, Schrodinger does the latter with a very great evidence. So he's not the only one to say things like this, right? He completely misinterpreted, right? This is just being lost, right? That this is what he was up to. So let's now uh, uh, go back. So what I want to do now quickly is just suggest to you, right, show to you, that with that in mind, with that hypothesis that I've offered you, you can understand why Schrodinger defended the genocide truth. You can understand why he thought that we should not consider all of the as important in biology, and you can understand why he uh, dismissed elasticity. Okay, so let's let's just take the first one. Right now, you may think that at the time this was the common view in genetics. It wasn't. Okay, this wasn't common. This it was not at all the case that most geneticists in the 1930s had this view of the genome, the genome, you know, the hereditary material being you know, the responsible for everything that happens in the organism, right? So uh, we know from the archives, so I've noticed that he actually asks for help. Um, uh, he asks um, the Zibran brothers, these are uh, physicists, uh, Carl and Hans, who's a biologist in Vienna, for um, literature, he asks about um, brownian motion. So he's already thinking about, about, about the structure of the gene in 1932. And then what happens is that Pasquale Jordan publishes this paper, the National Research Chapman, Quantum Mechanics and the Foundational Problems of Biology and Psychology, where he for the first time suggests that maybe quantum mechanics provides a foundation for biology and psychology. Now, when this happens, the brothers write to Schrodinger again and say, have you seen the last paper by Jordan? It's absolutely crazy. I think we need to stop him. He has to be stopped. He says, my brother and I are very pleased to have you as a confederate in the struggle against all occult forces, which he's referring, of course, to Giovanni. And they say, listen, Aaron, you need to publish. You need to write something to respond to, to, to Jordan. You need to do this. And also, you may be interested, perhaps, in reading, and they suggest, maybe read Muller. This is Muller's American geneticist. Read this paper, The Gene as the Basis of Life, from 1929, which will give you the sort of ammunition that you need to defend this static, fixed, deterministic view. They say, they, they say well, why don't you have a look at this book? At this, this book? <coughs> and so Schrodinger goes on and he writes, he, he presents in, in front of the, before the Prussian Academy of Sciences in 1933, this, uh, this uh, talk, this, this an abstract is published, this, Why Are the Atoms So Small? Um, which basically def provides the, the argument that I presented to you at the beginning of what it's like. It's already there in 1933. What's interesting is in the archives, there's an actual book called Baron, which is a reference to the so the, the preparation is like just under the bottom, you can't see it, but I, uh, I promise you that the last one is Muller. He read, we wrote down, uh, okay, make sure that you read Muller in preparation for uh, this presentation. So what does Muller say that is so incendiary? So well, he says actually, if you read Muller's paper, it, it's like a, it's an arch reductionist manifesto. He talks about the gene already as a material thing, as being the foundation of life, right? It's the, uh, the, all the, the, the entire protoplasm, he says, everything in the cell is a product of the action of the gene, you know, and it's basically arguing for this extreme genocentric view, which was not the consensus view at all. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that these three chapters in the book, much of the meat of the book is actually drawing on a paper. And this is a paper that's come to be known as the Three Man Paper. Here it is. Um, and it was these are the three people that. Uh, that are the, the authors, Timo Fedrosovsky, a uh, Drosophila geneticist, Russian based in the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, um, uh, Karl Zimmer, and Max Delbert, of course, who then would go on to, uh, to win the, the Nobel Prize, and who was very important in developing um, uh, molecular biology. Notice here, the fifth chapter is Delbert's one discussed. So 
Delbrook actually, this paper is important. Why is it important? Well, because it's the first attempt to actually bring together physics and biology, um, the quantum mechanics actually, you know, how that can be brought to bear to explain the, mod, the destruction of the gene. That's exactly what the paper does, right? Um, and so it's, so it's interesting that the paper book, right, is discussing Delbrook. Okay? <laughs> so it might be worth finding out what the paper is saying, especially because Max Perutin is lambasting destruction of the poor of Schrodinger. He says the chief merit of what is life is because it's so crap. Basically, the only good saving grace that we can mention is that at least it popularized this paper by Timofeev Zimmer and Delbrook that otherwise would remain unknown outside of the geneticists. So what is important about this paper? Well, what's in, you don't have to read this, but what's important about the paper, okay, is that at the end of the paper, in the conclusions, they present this view which is very deterministic. Okay? They talk about how, according to the conception of many biologists, right, genes, can, we can project back from the genes back to the organism, right? So the entire property of the organism in some way already located in the genes, he says, we can think of them as the immediate starting points of analysis, and we should not even think about the cell as the unit of life, because the cell ultimately is dissolved into genes. It's a very, very relevant, just the kind of stuff that Schrodinger needed, right? So that's really cool. But what's even more, well, so first of all, the cool thing is, of course, that this is a very, um, this is what the view that ends up in what is life that everyone knows, right? And it's also the view that seems to be reflecting Muller's position here. Now you may think, okay, that's interesting. But what's even more interesting is that this is not the actual view of the authors. This is the penultimate paragraph in the paper. And the last paragraph in the paper is saying this view is not one that we endorse. So this is the last paragraph in the, in the, our ideas, this is the last paragraph of the paper, challenge this picture. Do you think this is going to be convinced? Yes. But they're likely incapable of directly forming the morphogenic substances. They're incapable of being responsible for development. They're saying this already. They can also be hardly thought of the starting points of developmental sequences. Therefore, we need not to dissolve the cell into genes, right? So they're basically saying, no, we're not going to follow Muna here. And yet, that's not, <laughs> that's not what you find in the book. And you see, because most people didn't read this, because it was published in an obscure journal that disappeared after two issues, no one knows about this. And it was only thanks to the work of, um, of Phil Sloan, actually, in Notre Dame, who uh, uh, basically, as a graduate seminar project, translated this into English. Uh, that we now know this, right? So uh, Sloan um, uh, produced this really nice book called Creating a Physical Biology, the three-man paper on molecular biology. And what he's doing there is basically saying, look, guys, we've been wrong about this for 70 years. And surely they deliberately misconstrued the conclusions of this to serve his agenda. He didn't have to do that, but he served the agenda because he was trying to follow over here. All right, I'll be much shorter because I want to come to an end now about these last two, uh, the other two. What about order from the source, right? <coughs> now, it seems really bizarre that Schrodinger said this. That, uh, so, so again, I, I want to say it's not with the benefit of hindsight that we say he's wrong. No, no, no. He knew what he was doing. How, why do I say that he knew what he was doing? Because in the same year that What Is Life came out, Schrodinger published a little paper in Nature called The Statistical Law of Nature, commemorating Boltzmann. The same year. It was the same year, okay? 1944, and in that paper, to illustrate this statistical law, he uses biological examples. So it makes it really, really strange. The Australian is appealing to Darwin and Mendel as examples of statistical regularities, and yet in the book, that we all remember, he's saying the exact opposite. So why? So the only way I have to explain this is that he had an agenda. It wasn't part. He didn't. He knew what he wanted to say. It's not like he looked at biology to find out what biologists were saying and then presented it. It's like. He has a view, and he reads the papers that are going to give him the evidence that he needs to defend his position against people like Jordan, by reading people like Muller. That's what I think was, up, was going on. Again, this is not part of the story. No historian has looked at this. This is why I'm so totally bad, dazzled and confused that this isn't really, that we, that we don't know this, okay? Um, finally, 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 stochasticity. Again, is this something that we've learned recently? No, we've known about stochastic effects for more than a century. I mean, Brown in motion was actually, Robert Brown was a Scottish botanist working in the 1830s. We've known since the 1830s that stuck out there would have this jittering motion. Um, and even biologists, you know, Darcy Thompson, for example, an important biologist at the beginning of the 20th century, wrote, um, I want to read this, basically saying, look, if you're going to think about bacteria, instead of microscopic organisms, 
Forget everything you think you know about the milieu, because the milieu is not going to be one where gravitation is important or inertia. It's going to be a strange world. It's going to be a world where you know electric charges play a role, brown in motion plays a role. It's, you know, we, these are just different. So this was something that people knew. More importantly, perhaps and more compellingly, Max Delbruck himself, in his review of what is life that came out in the Quarterly Review of Biology in 1945, writes this about the book. He says, it's kind of odd that Schrodinger does not return in his later discussion to the problem of how the cell gets around statistical fluctuations. The careful reader will be disappointed by this admission. There were not many, not many careful readers because not many people were disappointed. At the beginning of the book, he says, the statistical fluctuations, when he's talking about order from disorder in physics, are represented as an unsurmountable obstacle for the physical understanding of the self. But later on, this difficulty seems forgotten. Without a final discussion of this aspect, particularly the enzymatic process, blah, 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 the argument of the book loses its strength. It says, where is the discussion of stochasticity? Where is it? If it's really the case, right, that at the molecular level you've got stochasticity, why does it disappear when Schrodinger starts talking about the cell? So again, I don't think it's unfair to talk in 2022 about Schrodinger having made this mistake because people at the time, even the person that Schrodinger mentions, Delbruck, is thinking, hang on a minute, what's going on here? Why is this not mentioned? All right, well, you've been very, very patient. Um, I now swiftly come to a close, so we have some time for discussion. These are my conclusions. Okay, so, yes, 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 the historians are right that what is like did intensify the focus on molecular basis of heredity. However, Let's remember, I mean, let's try to change the chip here. The book is not about genes, it's about order. It's about the nature of order. That is the question that is driving the book, okay? The belief that Schrodinger had that biological macromolecules must be extremely rigid and stable in order to withstand the disruptive effects of thermalization. This is the argument of the book. I argue prompted researchers to develop highly idealized models of cellular processes like the ones I showed you, you know, the gene brevity networks, the circuit diagrams, all of this I think can be sort of traced to this influence, making them less disposed to explore how the cell actually harnesses noise to generate, which is exactly what's happening now, by the way. If you look at molecular biology today, that's what people are really excited about. It's not about saying the stochasticity is not there uh, and how it's in use, but actually how the stochasticity is used by the cell to generate water, which is kind of exciting. But I can discuss that more in the QA if you're interested. I want to suggest that what is life is not really about advancing biology at all. It should rather be seen as showing this last wistful attempt to salvage this mechanicist, deterministic worldview from Boltzmann that had been undermined by the advent of quantum mechanics, particularly in the Copenhagen interpretation. And maybe we want to engage in some counterfactual history here. What would have happened if Schrodinger had given a different kind of answer to what is life? Would molecular biology have developed differently? You know, maybe if he had been interested in, in defending this indeterminist view, maybe more well, like a bunch of different this is something just to, 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 to ponder. And finally, I want to end with a sort of paradox, right? That it may just turn out that one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century is responsible for convincing biologists that they do not need to worry about physical forces in the work that they do. And it's taken us 80 years to unlearn those lessons. All right, you've been very patient. Thanks very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Okay. We have uh, yeah, a little bit then half an hour for discussion. Thank you for your talk. I think I will never speak again about Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> 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 no, because I, I was addicted to this wrong uh, representation. So now I know it was reduction at absolute. <laughs> so that's a really good reason to read your book. Thank you very much. I have a question. It's a bit naive. I don't know biology a lot. Uh, it's about the uh, Schrodinger paradox. I just wonder if Schrodinger's paradox. Paradox. The one he described at the very beginning of what is life. The paradox of the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if it's really solved uh, nowadays. Right. Uh, I will give some uh, argument. You know, the first point, mm -hmm. just just to yes, to explain my, uh, yes. my question. Absolutely. It's about uh, um, uh, the law of. Uh, uh, of a stochastic process, I mean, uh, uh, of uh, <coughs> in, when you have a series of variables, like Shannon theory with several variables, mathematically. Mm -hmm. I said this because it was my thesis in mm -hmm. applied mathematics. We don't have uh, complete laws, you know. I mean, and, uh, so, uh, and that makes problem when you 
go to information theory because mm -hmm. uh, you don't you, you cannot solve the problem when there are uh, a variable uh, a huge amount of variable and so I just wonder when you when you are in biology with all this graph it looks like information theory you know yeah. uh, you show us there was uh, many connection and so if we try to explain it in terms of uh, Shannon theory yeah. or maybe stochastic process maybe there is a mathematical gap uh, so maybe the paradox uh, driven by, by uh, Schrodinger still remain in some way different different way but yeah I just wonder and, and the other reason is that sometimes in philosophy in philosophy uh, in cognition uh, fields we tend to forget the role of specific role of genes and um, it looks like very structural and uh, we speak about autopoiesis and um, so maybe it's still interesting to wonder what is the the, the interest of gene in transmission, in information transmission. I just wonder if these two problems makes possible to think there is still a paradox somewhere. Well, okay, so the paradox itself, so people like Perrault, for example, said, look, the paradox is a consequence of Schrodinger not knowing his chemistry. Francis Crick also says this. He just didn't know chemistry, otherwise he would have used the term polymer or even micromolecule, which was coined in 1922, rather than crystal, which seems like an odd term to use. Uh, once you realize that, right, um, so, so they, they actually suggest that, you know, the, the, there is no real paradox because the stability, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to posit this extreme rigidity for, for, for example, polymers to, to, to exist in the way they do. And maybe that's just, he, they say, a consequence of showing they're not knowing his chemistry. <coughs> I think a more, a more full, fulfilling answer is the one that I gave you in the talk about what happens to this paradox, which is that Schrodinger is attributing order to one molecule. What we need to do is to attribute order to, you know, it's not an intrinsic property of the DNA, but it's actually a, a dynamic accomplishment of the cell. And the reason why that order is reliably transmitted is not because the molecule itself is super stable, and it's not because it's not being affected by stochastic forces. That's the wrong way to think about it. It's a, reduction, it's a very reductionist way. It's actually affected like everything else at the microscopic scale by, <coughs> by stochasticity. What is going on is that you have, as I say, this entire apparatus in the cell that is ensuring that that order is maintained despite fluctuations and reliably transmitted. Okay, so uh, in regards to your discussion of your mention of information, I mean, it's, it's something I'm discussing in the book that I didn't have a chance to talk to you now is what happens to this notion of order for order in molecular biology and guess what happens uh, the notion of order is replaced by the notion of information mm -hmm. so we go from order from order to order from information information becomes the buzzword that replaces the notion of order people don't really talk about order in molecular biology they talk about information information also replaces the concept of specificity that had been the reigning dominant notion in, in biochemistry and also in biology until that time you read people like Linus Pauling they talk about Specificity. That that this, that sort of language is lost, and what we have in, in, in its place is the notion of information. People like Robert Wiener, for example, in Cybernetics in 1948, mentioned Schrödinger, and he says, with Schrödinger we have, and he actually was already made the transition from order. He was already thinking about order as information. He's already talking about information as something real, something that is there, even though it's an import from communication theory on the part of Shannon, a consequence of the war effort by. 1948, already by 1948, Wiener is talking about information as a fundamental property of nature alongside energy and matter, he says. If you understand life, you've got energy, <coughs> matter, and you have information. So very, very quickly in molecular biology, you have the reification of this notion of information, which is, uh, but which ultimately, though, remains a vague metaphor. It means different things to different people. If you talk about information uh, to a developmental biologist, they will have something very different in mind than if you talk about information to someone working in molecular biology, right? You've got information in terms of the information code, the coding for amino acids from, uh, from DNA bases. That's one way of thinking about information. You've got positional information in developmental theory. You've got, you know, you've got, so the, the notion really, it's true that many people have tried to provide mathematical accounts of information that would do justice to the way it's used, but at least have all failed, right? Because biologists themselves are not very careful in the way they use the term information. Perhaps it is precisely the fact that the notion of information is semantically ambivalent that gives it its remaining power. They were not trying to, to 
to sort of provide some sort of operation, some definition that applies to all cases. But what's really interesting in any, in any event is that in the second half of the 20th century, what we have essentially is an idea of order from information. And you, I've actually even found um, correspondence with, uh, forget my terrible French pronunciation, Brioline, 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 not Brioline, Brioline, Brioline. Yeah, 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 right? Who's interested in developing this idea of neg entry? Okay? So Bruno is right in showing us, hey, maybe we can use a notion of negative entropy here to talk about information. Schrodinger is actually very, very skeptical. So Schrodinger, coming from a different generation, doesn't, is not prepared to even think about information in the way that Bill can be uh, uh, suggests. So I mean, um, you know, in philosophy about it, there's this long, this, you know, it's a well-known problem, right? The notion of information. Biologists seem to be very happy with this loose use of the term information. Philosophers of biology, I think, have been trained to be much more skeptical. Also because when you realize the history of the importation of this notion into biology, you realize there's nothing really inevitable about it. There's nothing really inevitable about talking about information as something real. But you know, many biologists think that that's the, that's the notion of order that we need. But it's definitely not something that you see in Schrodinger. Sorry, that may not have been a complete response to what you were saying. But, uh, yeah, no, I think you give a lot of context. I'm uh, very happy. <laughs> uh, and, but I'm about the seven points that we tend to forget mm -hmm. sometime in autopoiesis theory and activism. Maybe uh, the interest of genes. Genes, yeah, absolutely. I think that's quite right. I mean, that doesn't directly relate to, to my talk, but absolutely. I mean, in the autopoietic tradition, right, is coming from a concern with organization. And interestingly, is one that does not consider the genome as being the source of that order, right? It actually has more in common, perhaps, with people like Prigogine and others in physics who are more interested in providing a systemic account of order rather than one that traces the order to a particular molecule, which is what it's all about, really, basically. Are we talking about order in life as a, as, as a consequence? And, you know, is order the property of one molecule that is amplified, or is order an emergent systemic property of the, of the cell as a whole? And that debate is very much still alive in, in a number of different cases in contemporary culture. Yeah. Uh, can we say there is still a paradox to solve? What, is, what would this paradox be? Yeah, th these two paradox will, will be first to understand what information is. And, uh, but I, mean, I think that is not a paradox when you remember, right, that the notion was introduced in a particular context to solve a particular problem regarding engineering and communication, and was brought in after the war, right, to provide a common language to talk about molecular interactions. There really is no, I mean, there's only a paradox if you think already that information is something real. It's a paradox if you take the term seriously. Exactly. <laughs> if you don't, if you are sensitive to the history, then you're not saying that it's not useful. I would not say that we should, we should give up this notion. But I don't think there's a real paradox there anymore. That's what I'm saying. Yes, uh, I have a few, but maybe after that it will be you. But the first one is that at the end of the book, you, you argue for new laws that we will find new physical yeah, laws. Yeah, good. Okay. And it's very confusing for me because right. if I adopt your reading, yeah. where could they come from? Excellent question. Excellent question. All right. Well, I was hoping that someone would ask this. Um, so I was going because I knew he would. So, it's <laughs> so what Schrodinger? So what people have read into Schrodinger is that he has something in mind similar to what Bohr and Delbruck had in mind. So Delbruck was a theoretical physicist who got interested in biology because he <coughs> attended a lecture given by Bohr in 1932 called On Light and Life in Copenhagen, where he suggested the complementarity principle applies not just to physical systems, but to biological systems, right? Then you also, in biology, have a complementary, complementarity between a mechanistic description and a more teleological one. It's coming from the Kantian influence of his father, Christian Bohr, who was a physiologist, by the way. But that's a, that's a longer story. The point is that some people think that Schrodinger should be understood along the same lines as uh, someone like Delbruck, who actually got into biology because he was looking for the paradox. He thought, I'm going to find a paradox, right, that's going to sort of uh, lead to a new kind of biology. And maybe in that sense, it makes sense to talk about new laws. I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Why is it the wrong way to think about it? Because you can't think of anyone more further away from the Bohr view or the Delbert view than Schrodinger. Okay, what Schrodinger has in mind, I think, by this idea of new laws of physics, 
is actually new deterministic mechanistic laws, not statistical laws. Okay. Right? So I think what he had in mind was that if we really, really take this seriously, this program in molecular biology, we're going to end up having, coming up with discovering principles that suggest that the order is, deter is deterministic and that it's not statistical. And in fact, you could even argue that that happened, you know, that the reification of the genetic program in the 1960s counts. So I think Schrodinger would have been happy to count that as a new law of physics or the kind that he had in mind. New law because he was contrasting it with the, okay. you know, with the okay, so, it, so he's arguing that physics is going to statistical mechanics and quantum physics and oof, Biology will save the good classical. Yeah, exactly. Procession. Biology will bring this physics back to the classical. The good classical processual. And, and I'll give you a little, one more piece of evidence for this, which is that in the book, Schrodinger provides an analogy. He thinks, imagine, I don't know, I think he says, imagine that an ancient person sees a steam engine and looks at the operation of the steam engine. They would be like completely overwhelmed. They would not know what's going on because these these would be basically count as new laws. For him, and he seems to make that sort of connection that 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 it's just a matter of time before we realize. Schrodinger thinks that the living state, um, which is he thinks a solid state, is giving us, you know, sorts of regularities that physicists at the time were not considering, sort of dynamic deterministic laws that are not statistical. So I think that's where it, where it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can you tell? Tell us a little bit more about the tension, because you started with the idea that biologists didn't read, or will, nowadays didn't read, mm -hmm. didn't understand maybe mm -hmm. the book, and then there's, and then it's in tension with the fact that you argue that Lloyd had a big impact mm -hmm. on biology. So mm -hmm. how do you use yeah, this right. tension? Um, because basically you have two projects. You have that's what the book is really about, and then that's what the impact of the book on science. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that the way to resolve that tension is to realize that <coughs> it's a bit like a, like a tree. I don't have a pen, but um, it, it, it's like, you know, Schrodinger influenced someone like Monod, and mm -hmm. Monod influenced many others, so I don't need to show necessarily the influence of Schrodinger, because if I can show that Monod was influenced, then it's a second. It's a secondary influence, right? So if you think, right, basically what I want to show, right, is that Schrodinger is here, and Monod is here, and you have, you know, this, this is the 1940s, this is the 1970s, the publication of Chance and Necessity. Just to take Monod as an example, and this is now, in the 2000s, you know, that if I can show, if I can show this, so then, then, then I don't need to suggest that the, the, the scientists today understand the arguments and show is what is life. Or it's enough for me to show that the view that we have today of molecular order can be traced back to the view of people like Monon, Crick, and others, which itself themselves can then in turn be traced back to. Because that, so you mean Monon understood then? Well, it is clear that yeah. in the case of Monon, yeah. that he not only did he change his mind, but that he created Schrodinger, which is was why it's so cool. Like, it's very clear. I mean, you don't usually find such clear evidence in so a kind of way. Couldn't you say that it's Mono that made the big impact on Schrodinger? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, Mono had a big impact, <coughs> but Mono got that from Schrodinger. If there hadn't been, I mean, Schrodinger, uh, so Laurent Laurent was on written beautifully about this. So, Mono, when he's been his first work on uh, bacterial growth, is, the, is a play, appealing to st statistical regularities. So, that, so, Mono, on his own, would have never made that transition. Actually, if he hadn't read Schrodinger, you know, things might have been might have looked differently. And how do you explain the fact that it's, there's the myth around the book? Did you have because it sounds great to have a great physicist <laughs> talking about life. Biologists have an inferiority complex, okay? They're always looking up to the physicists and how wonderful it is to have someone like Schrodinger, right? The big man himself, devoting this time to thinking about life. and so. It sort of made sense from a sociological political perspective back in the 1960s when you go to accept your Nobel Prize to you know get a little nudge to, to show them. And that's what Boyce Wilkins did, and then very quickly many of the others followed. Uh, you know, James Watson, Francis Crick, many others, you know, Sidney Brenner, how, how much time do you have? Uh, Seymour Benzer, um, Joshua Ledber, Leidenberg, all these people I found evidence, and this is all gonna be in the book. This, it's, it's difficult, it's hard to find someone that wasn't influenced. You could do a scientometric, maybe it's not you that will write, but a scientometric to check between these two traditions, the more statistical one and the new mechanist, because yeah. in fact, it seems that 
that's what you're claiming is that it's the mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And look to the to how it diffuses in the, the literature mm -hmm. by uh, by uh, automatic study and yeah. digital humanities. And maybe right. there you could prove empirically like, the, the the scale of the inference. Yeah, absolutely. But and it's also, probably huge. It's probably huge because, as you said, in the forties that was not. No, it wasn't the, the orthodox you asshole. Well, is that? Uh, and the number of people obvious. who just the number of people who just throw a perfunctory citation of what is life into the first paragraph of their article in Science or Nature because it sounds cool to be able to put Schrodinger in the first paragraph of your paper in Science or Nature. It's like I bet it's a big number. I bet there's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, no, but it's it's a definitely it's it's a good thing to to try to look at, right? So one thing you can do, for example, is how was this book received? So. I found a really interesting uh, review of the book by Ludwig von Bertalanffy, right? Father General Systems Theory, also an important theoretical biologist based in Vienna. So he writes about the book and he says, wow, I mean, this is so... He first says, you know, we should be proud of Austrians, but as Austrians, <laughs> showing us here, you know, uh, the very interesting <laughs> and Then very quickly, things go, you know, turn, turn go south because he starts talking about how it's you know, the heart of life cannot possibly be something static, he says. We need a dynamic view because, of course, Bertrand is coming from that earlier tradition that understood that biological systems are open systems, that, that the exchange of, you know, the energetic exchange is going to be the heart of the matter, where, you know, actually Bertrand develops this idea of a steady state in his work. So it's very good to see him reacting to Schrodinger saying, this can't possibly be right. This view, which is so fixed and rigid and static, can't possibly be right. And yet, that's the view that what the, at the end won the day, right? And again, more I don't know if you noticed in the quotes I had, but he was directly attacking this sort of steady state dynamic view. The lecture that I'm quoting from, from 56, is all about you have this traditional orthodox view, which is dynamic. And that's what we need, that's the old view. The new exciting view is one that is fixed mechanical Cartesian. And now we're going back. Now, 2022, we're actually going back to pre-molecular biology days in some sense. You know, I'm not trying to deny, of course, and the, the incredible accomplishments of molecular biology, but what is really interesting is that um, we are now in a situation where we're beginning to take seriously again this, the, the importance of our dynamic picture. We're sort of unlearning the lessons of children. And that's why I got interested in this project. I mean, my earlier work was working out what was the problem with the contemporary view. And so what, I, what I'm doing in this project is giving an explanation <coughs> where this view comes from. Not by tracing it all the way back to Descartes in the 17th century Ben machine, but you know, more proximal explanation. Here we have Schrodinger in 1944 talking about this stuff. Anyone? Please. I have a follow-up. Yeah. Regarding the history of science point of view. Yep. And uh, when you use this kind of diagram, in fact, uh, Mono is the only missing link. Uh, and surely I probably need one. Do you have other yeah. yeah. candidates? Right. Are kind of, you, you can, mm -hmm. It could be a little limited if you want to argue that there's such an impact on this mm -hmm. room. Now. Do you have some candidates? Great question. Of, of not none as clear cut as we know. Um, and in fact, I spent two weeks at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory archives last summer going through the correspondence of Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner to see if I could find anything, and I couldn't. Um, so I don't seem to have any direct connection linking. Schrodinger by name in the way because you know the mono is so obvious, right? And in fact, for example, Francois Jacob says, even though he, yeah, it's in the logic of life, for example, he said he talks about the book, but what is life? But he then in his um, the statue within his autobiography he says he personally wasn't influenced by it. Okay, so they're not the case that every single individual. So, so yeah, I mean this is of course look, it's a hypothesis. I'm not giving you the the full story. It's a working hypothesis, and I'm suggesting that thinking about things in this way. Makes sense, and of course we don't want to say that Jorica was the only influence in, in us having inherited this view of order in the cell, this molecular biology agenda. But I think a very important one, which by the way has not been mentioned in what 50, 60 years of historiography. This is new, okay? This is like even though there's a lot of work on uh, what it's like, the only person that's written along. No, actually nobody. I mean, uh, Phil Slaw's work has been to show the motivations for but for for, for Schrodinger, but the idea of connecting Schrodinger with the agenda of molecular biology is just something, it's a working hypothesis. And you are right, of course, and I'm sure this will probably come in the referee reports in the manuscript. You can't, you can't, well, no, it's fine, but you need to give me more. So maybe I'll have to appeal to something like this to make my case. Direct secondary inference. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. 
Well, I would like to come back uh, on uh, determinism. Yeah. We, we know that Schrodinger was unhappy mm -hmm. with quantum weirdness. Yes, exactly. Because he told, uh, uh, sometimes he said, uh, if one were uh, in a position to manipulate a single atom, a single photon, it would be blatant that we would arrive at absurd situations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for us physicists, <coughs> we think that the Schrodinger cat is an example of this, of the absurd situations right. when you go down. But the problem now for, for us physicists mm -hmm. is that single atoms, single molecules and single photons are manipulated. Mm -hmm. And we arrive at the weird situations that Schrodinger would not have liked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, for us, the problem as physicists, we should try to understand where the weirdness, at what point the weirdness disappears. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you manipulate single or two or three molecules, mm -hmm. the orthodox uh, weird interpretation of physics, of quantum physics, exists. Yeah. But suddenly we have the, the impression that the weirdness dwindles mm -hmm. with the scale Absolutely. of the molecules. Yeah. And so we are unhappy about that. Mm -hmm. And the coherence is only a partial, partial explanation of it. Yeah, so actually you find that, I mean, for most of the second half of the 20th century, what you find is that there's no engagement on the part of molecular biology with quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And the reason is what you're saying, yeah. that it's just a different level, and even though molecular biology is still molecular, it seems to be all dampened. Uh, you know, the quantum effects, the, the weirdness, and the indeterminacy plays no role. Yeah. Now, that's basically the sort of canonical orthodox view. And, and actually, I, I tried to find references to quantum mechanics during bibliometric searches in the molecular biology literature. Hardly any, you can count them, you know, with a with the, with the figures of one hand, and if, if there are, it's to say that it's not relevant, right? Now, that's, it was di now what's interesting about that is that it's, that's different before Schrodinger, and it's different now. So I'll talk about each of those. It's different before Schrodinger because Pasquale Jordan uh, comes up with this research program that he calls <coughs> quantum biology. Already in the 1930s, as a consequence also of uh, his discussions with Bohr, who also increasingly showed interest in the application of his ideas to biology. And in the 1930s, he actually writes a whole book, it hasn't been translated into English, on uh, Physics and the Mystery of Life, it goes to six editions. And this is a book which basically proposes what he calls the amplifier theory. And the amplifier theory is that organisms serve as amplifiers of quantum effects. And that quantum mechanics does, in fact, play a massive role in our observation of the teleological, creative, spontaneous behavior of organisms. And by the way, because of that, we can also make a case for free will. So for Jordan, it, it goes, it's, it's, I mean, it goes from physics, right, <coughs> to biology, ultimately to psychology. This is already in the 19, early 1930s. Okay, he suggests this. Okay, and <coughs> so you know, quantum mechanics here plays plays a role in how we should think about organisms, and ultimately he wants to make the case for free will. Of course, we are organisms, so it's important to secure the biological foundations for any psychological argument, and in turn, it's important to secure the biological foundations of any physical argument. Right now, what's interesting is that this is of course completely speculative, and no one. Very few people take it seriously. Pasquale Jordan is an, unfortunately an ardent Nazi, so it doesn't work well for his reputation after the war, right? He actually ends up becoming a politician. Uh, and, uh, but you know, this, this is really picked up, okay? Quantum, quantum biology disappears. Um, until recently, and then now it's interesting, there seems to be a rebirth or reinterest in quantum biology. Why? Because it seems to be the case that in photosynthesis, um, on another example is the, ori you know, the orientation of, uh, of birds, and Charles and I were talking about this earlier today. There seems to be the case that quantum effects may be playing a biologically relevant role. So what was, what was like really sort of 
something no one did for 50, 60 years, which is to appeal to quantum mechanics and molecular biology, suddenly it's something that is uh, not only acceptable, but it's hip and cool. And you have new graduate programs being developing, developed right now on quantum biology. There's one big one in Sussex, for example, in the UK. Right? So that's kind of interesting. But the reason also why I wanted to hand this on before is that I really think that this, which is what Pascual Jordan is trying to do, is explains why Schrodinger gets interested in life. Because what Schrodinger wants to do, is to be completely clear about this, is to sever this link. Because if you if you stop this, then you can't you can't end up arguing for free will on the basis of quantum mechanics. So the entire program, as I see it, of what's in that book and what is life, is an attempt to show that, that we do we, there's no reason, it's completely uh, illegitimate, inappropriate to infer from the indeterminacy that you have from you know, quantum effects to the microscopic to the biological level. Okay, that's this this severing is really if I were to you know basically illustrate the whole you know, to summarize the entire talk of the entire motivation of Schrodinger in one uh, in two lines, it would be those two lines. Because in cutting that connection, Schrodinger is saying, um, you know, there is there is no there's not a thing. I mean, it's a bit more complicated because of course Schrodinger is appealing to quantum mechanics in the book, right? But for him, quantum mechanics is deterministic, right? So for him, quantum mechanics is providing the stability that he needs to argue for the rigidity of the periodic crystal. Right? It's it's quantum, quantum chemistry. Quantum chemistry, exactly. So Schrodinger is saying we need quantum mechanics, but not in the crazy Copenhagen view, but actually the good stuff, right? The stuff that enables us to explain the chemical bonds. So in that sense, it is applying quantum mechanics to biology, but not in the way that 99% of people think of quantum mechanics today which is in this deterministic view. So that's why it's so odd to see people today talking about quantum biology and they say, hey, well, Schrodinger is the founder of this view because they're, complete, they're completely misunderstanding. Of course, the, Schrodinger, of course, is interested in securing biology and quantum foundations, but the foundations are deterministic, not deterministic. And in that sense, he completely sets himself apart from all the other quantum theorists of the time. Yes? Yeah, uh, just, uh, I would like you comment uh, on the question that in the second edition of the book uh, he, he put a note in, in yeah. the negative entropy yeah. uh, regarding free energy. Yeah. And can of he argue that it's not necessarily gives uh, free energy in yeah. the sense of, of a ch only change of, of, of uh, matter and energy yeah. that could uh, could signify as, a, as, a, as a, the free energy, it's, it's something else. And that, to what extent, this free energy uh, that he was talking about is related again to, to the paper of war and life and light mm -hmm. and these teleological issues. Great question. I don't know. So the Bohr's paper, I mean, this is another paper I want to write about the influence of Bohr's address on molecular biology, I want to basically suggest that um, you know, the new biology, so the old biology, the biology of the interwar period was fascinated by Bohr and promised a new revolution that would be based on the new physics and yet the re revolution of biology when it finally came was not based on Bohr but actually on the 19th century deterministic view of physics, uh, which of course some cybernetics and some information theory thrown in. But, but you know, the, the, new, the, the new biology drew on the old physics rather than the new physics. And, and so it's nice for it to be told there about the role of, of Bohr. But going to your question about, um, about entropy, so something that people picked up on when the book came out was that he's showing they talked about negative entropy, right? And so many physicists thought this was that could make no sense. And so uh, in the second edition, uh, he added a note saying, you know, I've been told by some of my physicist colleagues that it would have been more helpful to talk about free energy, right? As a thing that is being used up by the system to maintain the order. Um, <coughs> That's as far, as far as that goes. I mean, the I find it very puzzling, right, that there's been so much emphasis on this. Because, well, again, when you do a little bit of historical work, you realize that Schrodinger wasn't the first person to note that there's no problem between the second law and and, 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 and by life. That had been a problem in the 19th century, but you have a whole range of authors. Fechner, Lopka, Rashevsky, um, Hill, Hopkins, a bunch of biochemists, right? Who were already done and were already talking about dynamic equilibria in the 1920s and are already show, you know, suggesting okay, that we don't have a problem here, here with the second law because 
you know, biological systems are not closed systems. And so the entropy is actually being increased when you consider the activities of organisms. So it's definitely not appropriate to suggest that Schrodinger in some way is the one that figures this out. And yet, you know, something interesting happens here too. So in, in, in discussions of thermodynamics and biology, often the first chapter begins with what it's like. And they're like, okay, what's going on here? And they often say, well, Schrodinger, you know, proposed this, resolved the, the paradox. It's interesting that even there you have the, the appeal to Schrodinger's name to legitimize a field. They're saying, well, you know, uh, the, you know, they're wanting to associate this pregogenian non-equilibrium thermodynamics research program in biology with Schrodinger. Why? Because it's cool. Because it's a perspective. Well, well, I mean, it's basically that, right? And again, this is something I want to also mention in my book. I didn't mention it in my talk. If you look at the history, you realize there's no reason. I'm actually making the opposite claim. So, on, whereas in the molecular biology case, I'm saying that Schrodinger did have an important legacy. I'm also at the same time saying that Schrodinger did not play a prominent role in suggesting that um, I know, that 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 order come that order, that was in, in developing this, this problem of self-organization. And the reason why he didn't do that is because what when he talks, so you know, he got this distinction between order from disorder, right, and order from order. Okay, the whole book is talking about this distinction. Now, people have said, well, you know, surely we was talking about order from disorder, so surely we can go from here to self-organization. Surely they never says that. Okay, Prigogine is writing in. Around the same time, 1947, uh, that's the beginning of sort of the, the Brussels School, actually, with, uh, of of uh, So it's a shame. I mean, it, uh, it, it could have Schrödinger maybe, you know, it could have happened that Schrödinger because he came close. He wanted to talk about energetics, and he could have thought, okay, maybe this provides a new form of order, and then maybe the maybe you know we need to enhance the concept of order from disorder to not only include statistical regularities of physics, but also this sort of self-organizing. Capacities, right? In fact, people like Primogene, I don't know if anyone knows this, but actually the very concept of dissipative structure was proposed to distinguish this form of order from Schrodinger's one. He talks about order from fluctuations. And he says, let's, he says to the reader, hey, don't confuse this with what Schrodinger means by order from disorder. Because I don't mean to talk about statistical regularity, I'm talking about a completely different kind of order that has to do with self organization. Interesting, huh? And yet now you have people saying, well, you know, actually, if you look at the Wikipedia page of What is Life, it's kind of fun. Uh, there's something <laughs> that, they, that they call um, the Schrodinger paradox, and guess what? The Schrodinger paradox in the Wikipedia article is about the, is the paradox of the second law and life. It's not the paradox of the book, it's actually the paradox that is a reconstruction, right? It's the idea of the, that was already solved by people in the 1930s. So, what I'm going to do in my book is actually provide evidence for this, right? Give you a couple of examples of people in the 1930s saying there is no problem, right? But I mean, this, this idea of the source of water coming from self-organization is, is developing around the same time, right? 1940 is, is still very, 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 very primitive. But by the 1960s, 70s, of course, sure, uh, Prigogine wins his Nobel Prize in 1977. And by that time, you know, he's writing with Stengers, you know, uh, all these wonderful books, popular science, talking about how, you know, order comes from nature. You know, people like Stuart Kaufman then in biology developed that order for free, right? Fundamental, interesting idea, right? That you can get order for free because that's a, it reflects a, a real this you know, property or sort of tendency in nature. But all of that is, of course, unknown to Schrodinger, right? So it seems really odd, right? To want to credit Schrodinger for this. It's just it's yeah. not because it's cool. Yeah. Yes and no because, uh, for instance, the, the, the guy hypothesis was this link directly to free energy to negative energy. Mm -hmm. This is the translation that James Robert made yeah. by reading Schrodinger. Making base his own experiments to, to analyze the, the atmosphere of Mars, the spectra of the atmosphere of Mars compared to the spectra of the, based on, on what he was reading on, 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 on Schrodinger. So, it, in somehow you have a, a kind of a empirical translation from the theory of Schrodinger to the formulation of the guy hypothesis, or at least to the results that. We don't need to send anything to Mars to know whether there is life or not, because okay. James Lovell look already was based on Schrodinger saying there is no way that we can get life on Mars because of the concept or the theory of free energy or negative. Okay, I'm not familiar with any of that. That's completely new to me, all of this that you just said, so I'm going to ask you to please send me you have, a, you have a new influence to add to it. Yeah, <laughs> I've never heard of this. Never heard of Schrodinger having an influence on Gaia or Lovelock or any of this. 
So that's interesting. If it's right, then it's more yeah, important yeah, to, yeah. to include that in my story. Yes, obviously. So it's four o'clock. Uh, I will have a little question myself, but we can talk about it over beer. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks to all for the time.